Hello everybody, this video is on more openings and the sample game I'm going to be using to show you the English opening is my game against Stephen Swanson who is a very strong player. Uh, ECF is about uh, 200, his uh, FIDE is, I think is over 2200 and this game was played uh, over a year ago but I felt it was too good an example of the English opening to not share with you. Uh, it, English starts off C4. And black has many responses. I might do another video on uh, other lines in the English because there's so many of them. But this one was uh, started off G6. And what white wants to do in the English is control the d5 square and the light squares in general. So usually the knight comes to c3 and the f1 bishop is finchettoed onto g2. So I start off that plan with g3, bishop g7, bishop g2. And here black has several avenues to go down. Uh, there's c5, which is, uh, you could probably guess the name actually, it's, it's the symmetrical English, uh, which is can be level for a very long time. Uh, d6 to uh, sort of prepare c5 or e5, kind of keeping your opponent guessing. Knight f6 is perfectly playable. C6 is not seen as much, but again, it's perfectly playable. You're doing a variation of a solid uh, Grunfeld uh, opening. Uh, An E6 can also be played, but again, isn't seen very much. And finally, F5 is a very... It's a rare sight, but it can be, can be played to go into a Dutch. Uh, however, uh, my opponent chose E5. So here, black is trying to take control of the d4 square in the same way I'm taking control of d5. So it's a battle over central squares. I now played e4, uh, which is, the is one of the moves I'm planning on doing. But looking back, it probably wasn't that good because there are several lines uh, that you can go down in the English and e4 does reveal my hand a little bit here. Uh, the better move would probably have been knight c3, and then I have several options. I could have played e4, I could have played e3, I could just have played d3 and not moved the e-pawn, and my knight on g1 can either go to f3 or e2, depending on my choice of moves. But e4... Uh, betrays the setup I'm, I'm about to use called the Botvinnik uh, system. Uh, black actually plays knight e7, uh, so possibly preparing f5, uh, so knight f6 wouldn't have been very good, it would have blocked in the f-pawn. I play knight e2, preparing to castle, and again this is a key move in the Botvinnik. Castles, castles d6. So just developing, uh, well, allowing the development of his bishop on c8. And now black's setup is quite simple here. Uh, it's got a solid pawn chain, c7, d6, e5. And one plan is just to throw up the f pawn now, maybe even going as far as f4. Black, in this kind of King's Indian type setup, is going to go straight for a kingside attack normally. And d4 is still able to be uh, looked at by black here. I wouldn't want to play d4 myself yet because that would open up his bishop. Uh, his bishop would have a lot of mobility along the long diagonal, whereas my bishop would still be sort of blocked in a little by my own pawn on e4. Uh, so yeah, d4 isn't ideal yet. Uh, in the Botvinnik, what you want to do is play d3. So you have uh, your pawns in this kind of triangle here, c4, d3, e4. 
And the idea after my next move, uh, which will probably be knight c3, uh, is that you want to control lots of light squares, and then at the right moment, you play either pawn to b4, going for the queen side attack, and or pushing to gain space, sometimes f4 to either uh, sort of gain space or to even attack on the king side, and finally d4 can be played later under the right circumstances to go for a central break and to get gain more control of the centre and to gain a space advantage. So black has several options. Before we go into the game continuation, there's knight bc6. So again, it's eyeing d4, and it doesn't really interfere with any other plans black could have. Uh, there's still the whole kingside attack idea. And if not, uh, the black knight could even just go to d4 next move. And if I don't take it, knight e to c6 could be played, reinforcing his knight. And if I take, he's gained a little bit of space with his pawns. So those are some of the ideas black has. And as I say, white, uh, or me in other words, uh, will continue doing the Botvinnik uh, general plan of trying to control light squares and then break on the dark squares. But he didn't play knight bc6. Uh, the one move is f5 immediately, going for pressure on the king's side nice and early. Again, I would probably play knight bc3 anyway, but uh, this is an interesting line. Uh, what you can do as black next in the next few moves is even play knight d7 and then knight on d7 to f6, sort of transporting the knight over to the king side. So lots of interesting variations here, and this is a, a Dutch line which is perfectly playable. But the move in the game was c6. So with c6, it takes away a square for his knights, but it isn't a bad move at all. It's not, I'm not saying that's a, a weakness in any way. Can you see what black is planning to do next move? Yeah, c6 prepares the move d5, and if black can get in the move d5, he'll be doing very well because he'll gain space, and my d3 pawn is a little weak if I were to do lots of exchanges on d5, and it would be a very uh, ba a very poorly um, utilised uh, queenside, uh, isolated queen to pawn. Uh, normally the isolated queen to pawn are on, are on uh, d4 or d5 uh, if you're white or black, but on d3 it would almost certainly be a huge weakness and I couldn't even pretend it was a, a strength, uh, in which sometimes isolated queen's pawns can be in uh, in sort of the queen's pawn uh, opening queen's gambits. Uh, but anyway, so d5 is threatened, and he will have three defenders of it: the pawn on c6, the knight on e7, and the queen. So I need four attackers. I've got three already: bishop and the two pawns. So I add a fourth with knight b c3. Now knight a6. And that does look like a weird move. And I can see why. As they say, knight on the rim, uh, knights on the rim are dim is, uh, is a rhyme uh, which can help to remember not to put your knights there, usually. But it's not going to stay there very long. And I don't really need to worry just yet. What black is planning to do is reroute the knight to c7, and that will add an extra uh, supporter to the d5 push. So black will then have four defenders on d5 uh, after knight c7. So I would either need to add a fifth defender, uh, sorry, attacker to d5, or have another plan, which I have. I play bishop e3, so I don't worry too much about his plan, I just want to develop all my pieces first. Knight c7 is played. 
And now, black actually has two plans available. The first is d5, as I've already laid out, and if it were black's move, he could indeed play that. But the other move, which is interesting, is c5. And the reason for that is that is that with the pawn structure like that, uh, white's control of d5 will be important. Uh, getting a knight onto d5 would be uh, ideal if it couldn't be uh, swapped off. And for black, the same is true of d4. So what black could play is knight e6, then knight to c6, and then he'll have two knights that can come into d4. Uh, and that position is symmetrical, and it's very hard for either side to really break down the other side. So I don't allow that. What move do you think I played as white in this position? Well, I've already laid out there are pawn breaks that white can try. I've already developed my pieces, so I feel that I've got sufficient control of the light squares. And the f4 break, while interesting, is not really something you see that much in the English. And black is planning a central uh, pawn push, and I think it was in my system, uh, Nimzovich, that he said if someone tries to break on the wing, uh, on the sides of the board, counter it with a break in the centre. So central pawn pushes are very uh, important and can be very useful, often more more powerful than uh, pushes on the wing. So f4 is a push on the wing, it's not that useful, and in the English you generally want to attack on the queen side anyway. So b4 is more logical, but it's too slow, it doesn't really achieve anything. So instead, d4 was played, breaking in the centre and potentially stopping any d5s, because this was not played in the game, but if d5, c takes, e takes, d takes, takes, so we're even on material just now, but after bishop c5, black's uh, pieces start to become very tangled up because of my space advantage and slight initiative. So bishop d7, I think, is best. I could just play queen d2, knight e6, bishop d6, bishop c uh, c6, maybe just put the rook on the open file get his rook out of the pin, and here I feel this, this position is very good for white. Uh, due to my initiative, I've captured, a, I've gained a pawn, and my bishop on d6, and the d6 square, as well as the f6 square, are very good places for me to put my pieces. So I would give this a, a big advantage to white. Uh, but that's just one potential line. I think I did check on the computer and it said I was much better after d5. So he didn't play that. He played knight e6. So he's now trying to take control of d4. But I've got three pieces, not to mention occupying it with a pawn. So I didn't feel too upset about that. I just played d5, stopping his break by uh, by putting my own pawn there, blocking it up. He then took... And then I recaptured with the C pawn, capturing towards the centre. Also giving my uh, rook something to look at on C file when I play rook C1 next move. And instead of knight C5, where I could just take it and have a protected pass pawn, he played knight C7. And then rook C1 was played. Uh, now, uh, I might go over this entire game in uh, my my sort of personal games uh, collection. But I'll leave this this opening part here because we've, we've got now straight into the middle game. Uh, you could argue that was a couple of moves ago, but I just wanted to show you sort of the culmination of the opening themes and plans that we were creating. So if we look at this position here, just to wrap up, 
Uh, it looks like White's Bishop on g2 isn't doing much, but that could change in the future with uh, maybe f4 being played a little later. Uh, it's, it's just defending the pawns as well, putting extra protection and pressure along the diagonal, so not bad at all. I love my bishop on e3, it's just pointing at the uh, both sides of the board. Uh, then my knight on e2 might be a little bit underused. I'm thinking, I was thinking at the time of perhaps go, uh, either moving the king and then playing knight g1 to f3, but that did seem a little bit uh, over the top. Uh, the other way is to find a way of playing g4 to clamp down on his uh, kingside pushes and then play knight g3, controlling light squares on the kingside. And finally, perhaps later on, I could play knight c1 to d3 if I move the rook. Or if sometimes there's an exchange of knights and I can put the knight on e2 to c3. So you generally want your knights on dark squares so they can control the light squares uh, in, in, the, in a lot of lines in the English. But also, my space advantage here is evident with the pawn on d5. Uh, just clamping down on lots of squares for his knights and bishop. So here I could even just throw my pawns on the queen side up and try and create uh, some areas of attack on the queen side. His king side advances have mostly been squashed with my central control. So if he plays f5, I don't need to worry about capturing him. I could just play f3. And then if he captures on e4, I can recapture with my pawn, and I've still got the pawn structure uh, the same, except the f-pawns have vanished. So I would keep my uh, grip on the centre, my, my advantage there. Uh, and I don't really think I'm in any danger. His pieces are so cramped that it's very hard for him to coordinate, whereas my pieces, having that, e that extra kind of rank uh, to use to manoeuvre, is is a huge uh, benefit to me. Anyway, uh, put any comments or, or questions, just thoughts on uh, on YouTube, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.